And it was just a conversation over a beer that, that you know, got got us into that, that business at the time. Depending on the role, it, you know, at times it can be stressful. But... So when you say struggle, did you, did you have food to eat? At least three people had to die before. Trade 80s. What happened to Australia now, man, after yeah. all these years? Yeah. The one thing they won't forget is how you made them feel. I mean, no surprise that, that the, the amount of competitors in the market shrunk. I've heard it many times that this industry doesn't have any friendship. Yeah, I'd never envisaged um, going into that, into that career. Uh, it, it wasn't what I wanted to do. Okay. Wrapped in plastic, um, you know, you grab a stack of six and throw it on your shoulder and run, but run house to house. What kind of a person you need to be to be able to work in? Sometimes you have to. Uh, that's just the nature of the world we live in. You know, if you want to put a roof over your head and food in your mouth, sometimes you have to do stuff that you don't like doing. Do you have your own thoughts, or you have to work within the strict rules? Well, don't be afraid to go after your dreams. Yeah. I'm going to be the next billionaire. Yeah. Oh, okay. There you go. Patrick, welcome. Thank you. It has been a while. It has indeed. But... Yeah. What, two months now yeah. in the making? About that, yes. Look, I have to, just before we start with anything, I have to thank you really for all your support that you have provided um, and assistance, feedback, including your family, your kids. You have beautiful kids that I do really admire. So well done for them. Uh, they show us a good sign of how and where this society is moving towards, uh, which I think it's, in, good, it's in, in a really good direction. So thank you so much again. And let's start with Patrick. Where does it all start, Patrick? Your childhood where you were brought up. And so let's dig deep into what happened in the past. Okay. Um, well, um, I was born in Sydney, uh, in Blacktown. Um, uh, spent the uh, first five years of my life in Sydney. Um, I was hit by a car on a pedestrian crossing and I, I broke my leg and spent six months in hospital. And the family decided to move up to the country. So uh, we moved up to Foster. Uh, and uh, uh, we lived there for a few years, and then then we moved up to Kempsey, where I spent pretty much the rest of you know my years through high school uh, and so on. Um, played so you mentioned six months in hospital. Yes. Well, what age was that? Around five. Five. Yeah. Do you still remember this phase? Yeah, absolutely. Oh my god, absolutely. It must have been really painful. Uh, well, the, the pain come, came later. It was in, when you're in shock, you don't really feel much pain. <laughs> so yeah. I, I was more concerned uh, when they took me to hospital because I, I, I broke my femur. And uh, I was more concerned when, they, when I got to hospital and they started cutting off my new school trousers. I was more upset about them wrecking my school trousers than, than uh, the damage that was done. But um, So I spent six months in traction in hospital mm -hmm. and then spent another six months uh, after that with the caliper on my leg. Um, to let the let the the leg heal, sort of thing. So, okay. So yeah, that was interesting. What do you remember with this phase? Um, I mean, a well, young kid in school. Would... Yeah, I well, I I actually I had to stay back a year at school, um, and then six months into that year of of being back one year, they put me back up into the next year. So I, I got back on track within yeah. six months, which was pretty good. Um, the one... Shows how smart you were since you were a kid. <laughs> the, the, I tell you, the one the one positive thing that came out of that um, was that I had to do a lot of rehabilitation rehabilitation exercise, and you know I got really fit as a young kid um, because of that, and you know I started playing a little bit of sport. Um, but up until up until high school, I was predominantly you know a bookworm. I you know, played a bit of lunchtime soccer stuff like that. Um, soccer in Kempsey. Kempsey, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That must have been like a really big team of soccer <laughs> back then. Well, I mean, in, in a country town, you know, you either you either play sport or you, you get in trouble with doing the wrong thing. So I, yeah. I chose sport. So, I, you know, I played cricket, uh, you know, on Saturday afternoon. I played baseball Saturday morning. I played hockey on Sunday. Um, uh, in in the winter, I played rugby league uh, on, the, on the Sunday, rugby union on the Saturday. Um, a bit of AFL when when I could, so it was all, it was all sport growing up. So, um, uh, but I was also a bit of a bookworm as well, 
Uh, yeah. Love to read. You know, used to um, read one to two books a week. Were you the quiet person type or? No, not really. Okay. No, I was, um, it was quite loud actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened to you now? Uh, yeah, true. Um, no, I, I was a bit of a jokester at school, you know, pulling pranks on people and stuff like that. So, um you know, I, I was involved in lots of different friends group. I, I didn't have a small friends group. I had a very large friends group. Okay. Um, but that came from all the different sports I was playing as well because I was interacting with different people playing the sports and stuff like that, which was good. So your family had to move just because of you? Uh, well, no, they chose. They, they chose oh, they to chose. move, yeah, because um, when I got hit by a car, I was on a pedestrian crossing. Okay. And my mum went to the local council and said, you know, why don't you put traffic lights there? Mm. And the response from the council was that at least three people had to die before traffic lights would be put up, mm. sort of thing. So um, mum didn't like that attitude, so off we went. We, yeah, I wouldn't like it myself too, yeah, so, for sure. Um, so, yeah, so it was quite quite good growing up um, in, in the country. Uh, Big family, Patrick? Yes, right? yes. So um, on my mum's side, six six children. Okay. Um, uh, so... You know, my my two oldest brothers, so there's Stephen, uh, Glenn, Adrian, my sister Diane, myself, and my younger brother Christopher. Uh, okay. Yeah. And then currently there is in excess of 25 nieces and nephews. <laughs> in excess of that. <laughs> God bless them. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's... A big family, a big family, yeah. So it is a big family. My sister, as an example, has had nine children. So, yeah. So, you talk a lot, you mentioned your mum. What about your dad? Uh, so, my, my, my real father died when I was little. So, my mum had remarried. So How little? I was three. Uh, so, you don't remember anything? I do have some vivid memories, but mm -hmm. not much. So. Okay. Um, but my mum remarried, so she was with my stepfather when, when we decided to move from Sydney up to the country. So, yeah. Mm. Um, and then... Was it tough for your mum to raise six kids? And Well, when my father died, so. she was a single mum for a while. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, back in the days when the wage disparity was quite, quite large. Um, so we did struggle for a while um, until she got remarried. But um, you know, we, we we made do. We we did what all kids do. We stuck together, um, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, we just made the most out of life. You know, having fun, going playing in the street, stuff like that. So, so when you say struggle, did you did you have food to eat? Yeah, like, so we, you, we you did, had the but we just didn't have the luxuries. We didn't have the luxuries, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So you know, we we didn't have five pairs of shoes. We had one or one pair of shoes. And stuff like that. So we, we we went for a few years like that where it was it was a bit of a struggle. We didn't have luxuries, but we got by. Mm. You no, know, we did what we had to do. Okay. Yeah. So after school, you went to high so, school, and then yeah, so I went to high school, um, and then uh, a week after I turned eighteen, um, uh, I moved to Sydney. Uh, came back to Sydney, moved in with my sister until I got my found my feet. Um, got a job working in a warehouse. Um, that made, then I had enough money to move out on my own. Um, and I did that for a few years. Uh, so you didn't finish school at all. You just eighteen. See you later. I'm moving out. And my yes. year, I was seventeen in year twelve. Okay. So yeah. So I was eighteen after I left school. So yeah. Um, How did you do in school? I did well. I, I did go to year twelve, but I, I didn't finish year twelve. Okay. I went and I did the trial. The trial HSC, um, but the only reason I went to year eleven and year twelve was because I was playing sport for the school teams. <laughs> I was playing cricket for the first eleven. I was playing uh, rugby league and rugby union for the school. So, cricket, um, interesting. Yeah, uh, cricket was a big part of my life. So, uh, one like sitting now watching the grass growing, and this is what cricket is all about. <laughs> Not when you've been brought up with it. Um, okay. When you've been brought up with it, um, you know you'll happily go and watch a test match for five days. Uh, because you understand the skills that are involved and the, uh, you know, the, the 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 intricacies of the game, you know, and and you know how to play it and and so on. So, yeah, but I, I was an all rounder when I played cricket as well, which meant uh, I I was bowling a lot, so I was always active uh, in the field, and I was a middle order batter. So 
Um, you know, I wasn't just sitting around most of the time. I was actually playing. So, so you were the player. Uh, yeah, we did. I got MVP many many years in a row. So, so back to Sydney, got yeah. a job in a, as a store manager. Um, yes, so did that for a while. Um, did the usual thing you, you do as an eighteen year old when you come to Sydney. You do a bit of partying uh, as you do, uh, and you know this was the late eighties. So uh, yeah, that was party central Australia. All the world over was party central in the late eighties. What happened to Australia now, man? After yeah. all these years, yeah. So, um, and that carried on. But um, anyway, uh, so uh, and then so a lot it, of partying and drinking and yep. the eighteen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so did that for for a few years. Um, there's a few stories I can tell you for that one, but maybe we'll leave those on the line. <laughs> no, well, we're here to talk, aren't we? Yeah. So. Um, so then in, uh, when Optus got their, their license, um, in Australia in 1991, um, they started to build a, a mobile network and then Vodafone got their license in 1992. Um, and I, I actually decided I wanted to change jobs and go work for a, one of the mobile phone companies that sprung up overnight, almost overnight when Vodafone stepped in. There was almost over like 600 to 900 mobile phone stores uh, and businesses that, that opened their doors. Um, and I thought, geez, it'd be nice to have a mobile phone. And I thought, well, the way I do that is go and work for a mobile phone company. <laughs> so they'll give me one. Just to get a mobile phone. Just to get a mobile phone because they were very expensive at the time. Um, uh, although well, you have, you have to uh, have a plan and it'd be heavily subsidised, but the plans were expensive. So. So I went to work for a, a mobile phone vendor and uh, you know, was quite successful there, you know, selling mobile fleets uh, um, uh, to enterprise. Um, and then they eventually uh, went belly up. So um, I did some business with a mate of mine for, we probably did it for about eight months, uh, where we were buying and selling mobiles, uh, fleets. Uh, so, you know, these deals that were going bankrupt would, you know, they'd have a hundred Nokia 2110s or Ericsson 337s, um, you know, and they used to cost with the Austel uh, sticker on top anywhere between $900 and $1,100 per handset mm -hmm. for these, for the for Telstra and Optus and Vodafone to bring them in. And there was a shortage of handsets. So when a dealer was going broke, we'd get a phone call saying we've got a hundred Ericsson 337s and we give them 500 bucks per phone. Um, and then we bring Rotophone as an example, and say so we've got 100 Eric, Ericsson 337s, um, we'll sell them to you for 900 bucks. <laughs> um, so, so you're if, doing the dealing. In the yeah, so if you do the maths on that, we were making some very, very, very good money. Um, so I did that for about eight months, and, and I managed to save quite a substantial amount of money. So I thought, it's time to travel. So my girlfriend and I at the time. Um, so let's step back a bit. Yeah. Because I know, like, from a, st a store manager, moving towards IT, it's a, it's a step for you, yeah? Yeah. So was there any details around that? Like, did you just decide, it, you walk up one day and say, oh, okay, I need to just work for a company, and then yeah. you simply well, went it literally, and worked for a company? It literally came down to the fact that, like I said before, I wanted a mobile phone, and I couldn't afford one. So... um the way I, way I thought about getting one was to go work for a mobile phone company. So, and there were lots of them starting up, so it was pretty easy to get a job. Yeah. So, um, but I did, I excelled. I did very, very well uh, whilst I was with that company until they went broke. Um, and then, as I said, Tom, um, the business partner I was working with at the time, we did the buying and selling mobiles for about eight months. And then the, the bottom fell out of the market because the mobile phone companies got their act together and their, the stock uh, availability became, you know, readily available in Australia. Mm. So that was when we stopped that, and uh, I decided to go travelling. So you uh, told me before a story on on the pub it was a beer in a pub. Oh yeah, so yeah. yeah. So, but that's so when this particular company went belly up that I was working for, uh, one of the guys I'd met who was a vendor uh, for the company, we became friends, and we went to the pub. We we're having a beer at the pub. And we talk, I was talking about, you know, getting belly up. You know, they, they didn't pay all the commissions I was supposed to pay me and all that sort of stuff. And 
Um, he had some invoices that he'd submitted that never got paid. And uh, and then it was literally uh, someone talked to me, rang me up about you know, having some, some mobile phones. They needed to raise some cash. And I was with Tom at the time and I said, Tom, do you know anyone that would buy these phones? And he went, yeah, I do. <laughs> and it was just a conversation over a beer that, that you know, got, got us into that, that business at the time. So. And from there on, you just, you travelled through like IT and communication technology. Yeah, well, I, I, I kind of went on a bit of a world trip for two and a half years first up. Yeah. Um, travelled. Uh, so you saved a bit of money and so, said, oh, okay, I've got a bit of money. I have to burn them now. A couple hundred grand, actually. That's what you do when you're young. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and look, travelling overseas is, was a bit of a rite of passage for, for the, the 20, 20 somethings in the in the 90s. It was just the, the done thing. You know, you got yourself a work visa and you went travelling. Um, you know, you'd always up, end up in the UK and working, you know, for a pub or something like that and travelling around. Um, so, so where did where did you first travel to? Like which country? Um, went to Thailand first up. Oh, Thailand. Yeah, okay. went to Thailand, went to Cambodia. Um, With your girlfriend to yeah, Thailand. Yeah, that's um, oh, a bit challenging. No, not at all. Not at all. Okay. Um, we went to Cambodia, Vietnam, Malaysia. Um, uh, we went through to Singapore. Um, uh, we went to Philippines. Um, Fell in love with an island there called Boracay, which was an absolute paradise at the time. It's a bit over touristy now, so it's a bit spoiled. Yeah. But um, back then it was absolute paradise. So I've actually been back there about nine times. Okay. So, um, so then the Philippines, and then we went to Dubai, and then we went across to Israel. We did a kibbutz for three months, yeah. um, which was interesting, um, yeah, but fun. You know, mm-hmm. eye-opening, and then we we went to London, and because I had plenty of money, uh, in uh, we went and rented a place in North London, uh, and that was our, if you like, our home base for two years, uh, and then we just literally were going back and forwards to Europe for all the events. So we went to Oktoberfest in Germany, we went to Paris, we went to um, the running running the bulls in Pamplona, we went, you know, Spain, uh, Portugal. Um, we did a couple of weeks in Russia, and we literally just travelled all over Europe for t- for two years, right? Which was great. So this is all because of your saving yep. of the deal you've done with your mate in yep. the pub. Correct. Amazing. So yeah, started with a with a, a phone call and a, and a beer and a conversation. So yeah, um, so uh, it was just meant to be, I guess. But uh, yeah, so uh, did the two and a half years travelling. Um, uh, I broke up with a girl, my girlfriend, um, and, while I was in London. Um, but she wanted to stay in London and I wanted to come back to Australia. I don't want to go into your personal life. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Um, Do you want to say hello to her now after all these years? Or <laughs> no, you don't no, actually it's talk? fine. No. <laughs> That's fine. Um, um, so uh, came back to Australia. Um, uh, wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. Um so I, I ended up working with my sister uh, for about six months, uh, delivering phone books, funnily enough, uh, which was quite interesting, you know, all these... The big yellow pages. Yeah, yeah, the, okay. wrapped in plastic. Um, you know, you'd grab a stack of six and throw it on your shoulder and run run house to house and drop <laughs> them on the front doorstep. And I got incredibly fit that six months because it was, it was quite hard work. And imagine. the money the money was actually quite good. It was very good money. Um, uh and then I thought, well, now it's time to get a real job. And uh, I started looking at the market and I thought, well, maybe telco might be, you know, it was a burgeoning industry still at the time. Um, this is 1997 by this stage. Uh, and I, I looked through all the job ads because, you know, that's where you had to look. In the old days, you had to look them up in the paper and things like that rather than looking on the internet. And um, uh, I interviewed for a, a, a company. Um, it was a, t- a telecommunications company, um, Macquarie Telecom, and I ended up being with them for 13 Can we years. Cut Macquarie Telecom, please. Like, yeah, or else we do, we're just doing an ad for them uh, for okay. free. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I worked for the, uh, a telecommunications company <laughs> for 13 years. Now you can match Macquarie <laughs> Telecom. <that's fine. laughs> so um, maybe they will share our episode. You never know. Yeah, yeah. 
And look, that, that was quite a, a rewarding um, career journey. Uh, I started as the, the telemarketing manager to build a telemarketing team um, uh, so they could make appointments for the salespeople because the salespeople were terrible at making their own appointments. Mm. Uh, but I was also spending half my time selling as well. Um, and I was still managing the new budget. Which so was selling good. was part of your life all the time? Really? Yeah, I sort of fell into it. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so yeah. I, Didn't I, you have any other passion, like to do something else? I was still actively playing cricket and uh, a bit of rugby league at the time, sort of thing. So that was uh, my passion. And then, of course, in the late 80s and the, and the 90s, it was that era where going out and, and, and having a drink at the pub and going to a nightclub and stuff like that. that. That was that era where that's what you did. So, you know, you'd end up going out having drinks, you know, four nights out of five yeah. uh, during the week with your, with, with your work colleagues or meeting up with mates and things like that. Um, and it was just part of the culture, you know, you, you know, and it probably didn't do my liver any good, but you know, it, it, it's the way it was. And, and Telco, in, in, in a way, is very much geared towards that sort of culture as well. Because, yeah, I want to get into this yeah. later on. Um, and it, it's it, – maybe I should go back to that 13-year period because there was a lot of experience in that. So, um, no, maybe we should, you should tell me what um, – you had a passion for art too and you were doing a bit of acting. Oh, that, that was when I first came to Sydney because yeah. I was doing the, the, the job in the warehouse. Um, and I went to drama school, studied under Brian Siron. Um, uh, and, you know, I did a little bit. I got parts in, in country practice and Dirtwood a Dynasty and High Tide and, uh, and Neighbours and so on. But back then, there was no mo- there was not good money in acting. I mean, uh, Sid Halen from a country practice was the highest paid actor in the country. And he was on 100 grand a year, but he was st- doing 70 hour weeks. Sort of thing. So um, there, there was just no money in it. So I, I gave it up and put a certain tie on and got into the the sales world, which was going into that mobility stuff. So that was very early on. Tell me something. Uh, like, did you ever imagine yourself working in telco at all? Like, when you started, when you were young? Uh-huh. When you grew up, no. obviously telco didn't exist like as you no, know, because back then you had yeah. you had um, telecom and OTC, yeah, um, and there was no competition at all. So yeah, I'd never envisaged um, going into that into that career. Uh, it, it wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I was I was really into the theatre because I was brought up around the theatre. Um, you know, uh, it, it was very much part of my mum's life as well. Um, she used to do the club circuit when when she was in, in her twenties, um, and yeah, I, I really didn't have my mind set on anything else at the time uh, because it was what I wanted to do. Um, but like I said, it, it came down to uh, being able to put a roof over my head and, and 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 food in my mouth, and acting was just not doing it sort of thing. So that was why I moved away from that and and made the decision to sort of you know go into the corporate world. Mm. So. Is it really still doing it now, like acting? Like, do you make money in acting? Oh, there is money. Days? There's good money in acting now, but you know, my time's passed. I think for that. So. Yeah, so, yeah. I can imagine you acting now. Like. Yeah, I've got I've got two daughters to support. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So your options are limited now. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So you know, life kind of gets in the way sometimes. Yeah. Um, and and you have to start prioritizing things a little bit. So something you jumped into something your heart wasn't in it at all. Oh look, don't, no, don't get me wrong. I did enjoy the people part of it, you know, and, and still do. Um, you know, it, it, for me, it was about building relationships, yeah, because um, that's that's what you had to do in telco. You know, you, if you were in the sales side of things and you were, you know, uh, in a competitive uh, bid for a customer. Uh, the company I was working for was traditionally more expensive than than other companies um, because there were, there were other companies who were just making a money play, you know, to, you know, give you a, a big discount. We save you this much money, come on board with us. Um, and, you know, we, we, we were never going to win that because we weren't, you know, in that sort of market of being able to buy businesses. So, so we had to build relationships with people. We had to build trust with people. You know, it's... 
in a sales process or even an account management process, you know, people people will forget a lot of what you say. Um, people will, you know, uh, forget you know, what you're wearing, what you look like, those sort of things. But the one thing they won't forget is how you made them feel, right? And if you make someone, you know, feel good about the relationship, about you, about what you're going to deliver, and you get trust, then you get success. You know, it's that's how companies are able to sell a product, you know, for thirty percent more than their competitors because they build a relationship as trust. Mm. So yeah, um, and I, I've always loved, you know chatting with people and getting to know people and building relationships and so on. So, um, Look, Patrick, before um, you've mentioned your mum a few times. Yeah. Um, I don't want to ask you the hard question, but was she your, or is she still your idol person, someone you look up to and say? Oh, absolutely. A- absolutely. She was very much the matriarch of the family. Um, and she had to be because, you know, there was... Uh, when my father died, um, uh, she had to be on her own to look after the family. So she had to be a very, very strong, strong person. She quite often was working two and three jobs at, at, at a time. Um, she she uh, was became a welder, right? And she was getting paid fifty percent of what the men were getting paid as a welder. Amazing. She worked she worked at a chicken chicken farm, um, uh, you know. Slicing yeah. and preparing chicken. Yeah. yeah, cutting the heads off chickens and defeathering them and all that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, she just did whatever she could work-wise to it's bring really money. hard work yeah. for a woman. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. And raising kids at yeah. the same time. Yeah, she did some nursing for a while, psych nursing for a while. Um, but then obviously when my stepfather came along, it made things a lot easier uh, financially and we, we started to be able to get some of the luxuries in life that we, we hadn't for, for a number of years. Um but it was, it was, you know, she's was definitely an idol. Um, you know, we she'd she'd you know be working a night shift or something like that, and she'd come for an evening shift, and I'd wait up for her, you know, when I was little, and uh, we'd end up. She'd come home, and we'd stick on a a, a record on the on the record player. Uh, her favourite was Nana Muscuri's. <laughs> and then we just snuggle on the lounge listening to music and stuff like that. Or, you know, the occasional treat we had was we'd get a loaf of fresh bread from the bakery, a jar of strawberry jam and some cream. And we'd have bread with jam and cream on it. So that was a luxury that we occasionally had. So, uh, but yeah. What do you remember of your mum still oh, till now? Oh, a lot. A lot. A lot, yeah. So I was quite close to my mum. So. so if she looks back on you now and say, like, would she be proud of you? Yeah. She told me many times she was proud of me. So um, That's nice. And and she always said, look, you can do anything you want if you set your mind to it. She's always very encouraging, you know, around that. She never, never said you must go to university or you must do this or you must do that. She's always said, look, I'll support whatever you want to do. Um, you know, if you put your mind to it, you can succeed at whatever you want to do. Sort of thing. Where's so your mum now? She's passed away now. She passed, passed away. away some years back. So, um, uh, so yeah. So I've always I've always taken that part, and and throughout my career, I've I've gone so, into many roles that I had you know no right to go into because uh, I didn't have the experience, and I simply adapted and then succeeded at the role. So if you bring her back for one minute now. What would you tell your mum? Thank you. Simply thank you. Simply thank you. And, of course, that you, I love her and stuff. So, Look, yeah. all respect to all the mums out there. Oh, absolutely. Because I know they're doing it, still doing it tough. Yeah, yeah look, regardless. Mothers do. Yeah, so. Um, but, yeah. Excellent. So, back to Telco and the life in Telco. Yeah. Yeah. And, so. and IT. It comes with a package. We all know that. What kind of a person you need to be to be able to work in the telecommunication industry? Telecommunications is a very diverse industry. So, you know, sales and account management, you have to be a people person. Right? You have to you know, be able to 
to talk to just about anyone about anything and build relationships. You need to do that in those two roles. Otherwise, you simply won't succeed in those roles. But then there's the technical roles, you know, your, your engineers, um, your software developers, um, your billing people, um, service delivery managers, project managers. You know, it's, it's quite a diverse industry when it comes to roles uh, or career paths for people. In diversity of roles, it's probably the most diverse industry that I can think of with, you know, the diversities of career potentials uh, in that. So what goes behind the scenes? I know we, we all know the nine to five, but what goes after the five? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> in, in, in the early days, um, it, it certainly wasn't nine to five. It was, it was more like, you know, seven to seven, um, you know, because you just, you had to work that way to get things done. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, you know, it's, that was a time when, when companies across the board weren't, they weren't geared up for IT. Yeah. All right. So it would be quite normal for a lot of companies to to have limited amount of PCs in their offices and stuff like that. So I can, I can tell you now that um, with this particular telco, uh, there was one PC in the sales area, and all the sales people had to share that PC. Yeah. All right. So it was nothing unusual to be still in the office at nine o'clock on a Tuesday night waiting for your turn to use the PC so you could bang out a proposal for a customer. All right. So but that was a lot of fun too. Oh absolutely. Absolutely. You know we, we a lot of parties. Yeah we a lot had, of drinking. Yes, yes, we, we did have a lot of fun. Um and it was normal. As I said it was normal, you know, for four four to five nights a week for you to, you know, go out and have drinks with fifteen colleagues and twenty colleagues and stuff like that. That was quite normal. And you and you had your you know your locals that you you can go to um, uh, so yeah but and then interstate staff would come in and go let's go for a drink <laughs> so and, and like I said it was that era it was very cultural um, and normal to do that you take customers out for drinks you take customers out for lunch have drinks over lunch um, you know you take them for dinner um, and have drinks over dinner. Um, because you want to build those relationships. Then, the, you know, the company events, same thing. There's, there's always drinks and stuff like that. And it is very much a thing in the, in the telco industry. Um, it's a common thing that happens uh, quite a lot. So you have to be a certain person um, to be able to survive in this industry, you know? It, it, look, it, How much drugs play, um, that, play oh. a role in this industry too? Not a lot, not a lot. I mean, you, you hear of people, um, you know, doing cocaine and stuff like that, but you never heard of anyone doing hardcore drugs yeah. um, in the industry. I'm sure it happens, but, um, you know, it wasn't prevalent at all. So, um, you know, it wasn't, it, you know, cocaine was probably the, the one thing you'd see every now and again, yeah. but even that was too expensive for, for a lot of people. So it, it just never happened. Um so for the new um, kids who are watching you now, yeah. or the, the young kids, what we're talking about here is AI drinks, cloud computing drinks, yeah. um, managed service drinks, yeah. mobile phone drinks. Yeah. Um, your package is all about everything in technology and drinks at the same time. Yeah. So drinking and building your relationship with your customer are really they go hand to hand. Well, they they certainly do with uh, a lot of telco. Not, I mean, there are people in the industry that are, are non-drinkers, or they're, they're you know they they'll drink very little. Um, but it becomes it's challenging though because you know as I said you know it's, it was very sociable. The sales team was encouraged to go out and socialise and you know and get on with each other and things like that. It was very much about team building. Yeah. Um, and you know telco. Because telco had deregulated uh, completely in 1997, you had oh, a dozen telcos competing with with each other in Australia. So what you found is each of the telcos, you know, like companies do, they try and build a culture. Yep. Um, but in, in telco, they did it uh, much more because if they didn't, there'd be a high turnover of staff moving between all the different telcos around the place because – People were being headhunted left, right, and centre in, in the telco industry. Um, 
So, you know, companies try and build a, a culture and part of that culture is having events for your staff, um, you know, and that usually meant drinks and things like that. So, you know, again, it, it was very cultural across the industry at the time um, because they wanted to build a culture to retain staff yeah. and keep people happy and they encourage people to build friendships within within the company as well. So, so over the years, you've seen all the changes, yeah. really. Yeah. How much did you see? And what was your, what was the most impressive part that you have watched in this industry? And again, what do you expect that's yeah. going to hit the market next? Look, I mean, no surprise that, that the, the amount of competitors in the market shrunk uh, over the years. Um, and that was a mixture of companies going bankrupt um, and companies uh, you know, buying out another company and so on, so mergers and acquisitions. Uh, but I, I think telco right now is kind of going the other way. It's it's actually more about deliverability. It's about outcomes rather that the price concept in telco, whilst it's important and it's still a consideration, um, it's not as as important as it was years ago. You, you've got to understand that in in 1991, when Optus got their license and there was competition started in the country, um, and then you know Vodafone in '92, the marketplace in Australia was very IT illiterate. All right, so you'd go and talk to a customer, and they would want to talk about cost because telco you know, was a very expensive, very expensive cost back yep. then. You know, you, local calls were like twenty five cents and. ST, you know, call to a mobile was like a dollar fifty per minute sort yeah. of stuff, um, but because IT was not a big focus for many companies, all right, um, they were very IT illiterate, mm. all right. And so it was, if you like, the burgeoning of of telecommunications and and options, you know, because up until then, they pretty much just did what Telstra told them to do. And, and they bought what Telstra told them to buy yeah. sort of thing. And they never had much leverage in, in, in changing that until the, the competition came into play. Uh, but what, what's happened over those years is customers have become extremely literate when it comes to IT now. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and that's even non-technical people. They'll still understand I mean, IT and the telecommunications industry uh, products and services, you know, what they can negotiate between different vendors and so on. Um, so you, you've gone through that illiterate IT sort of situation to a very literate in, in IT uh, situation today. So you kind of have to have a, a, a good IT knowledge now uh, to walk into a customer and, or prospect and, and, and make the sale. Um, because you're not going to be talking just price anymore. You're going to be talking functionality. You're going to be talking you know, cloud services. You're going to be talking about you know, um, uh, security. You're going to be talking about you know, hosting. You're going to be talking about networking, um, you know, VPN networks and so on. You know? uh, so what is the next for the market? Well, sec- I know it's, security a, it's a billion-dollar question. It, it if is. If anyone knows, it, they, it they'll be billionaires now. Yeah. But what do you see coming up soon? Um, or oh, you haven't really thought I, about it? I, I, no, honestly, I haven't. I haven't thought about it um, because I, you know, got out of the industry for a year. Um, but you know, if I think about where the priorities are these days, I, I think the industry is going to continue on its current journey. Security is going to become more and more and more of an issue. Um, everything's going to the cloud. Um, you know, so that that's going to continue. Uh, I, I can't imagine a new technology that would, would yeah. turn up tomorrow and change. Well, I've got a few ideas, so, okay. yeah. Okay. So, but I'm going to keep it for myself. <laughs> I'm going to be the next billionaire. Yeah. Oh, okay. There you go. All right. Um, uh, I'll, I'll come for riding your private jet, jet <laughs> when you get it. So. Um, yeah. So, so what's look- your advice for the new generation, the new kids? Like and they finish off their high school now, they're a bit lost. And obviously, IT and telecom is an option. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. What do you advise those kids? Um, so it was very different when I left high school. When I left high school, um, you, you didn't need a degree. You didn't you need a university degree for most jobs out in the marketplace. Um, you went normally, you worked and, and, and you learnt on the job. 
You know, you've got apprenticeships and, you know, companies that hire you and train you. You know, Telstra would hire people and train them on electrical engineering and stuff like that. Um, so you'd learn on the job through either an apprenticeship or, or just the fact that you start and they tra- they teach you the job uh, on the run. Um, nowadays, you kind of need uh, a university degree for 90% of the roles out there, you know. Um, so, yeah, if you want to go into telco, then computer science, uh, engineering uh, would be the areas of university you'd need to look at. Because um, I honestly, uh, I, I don't know... I haven't heard of any apprenticeships, if you like, um, uh, you know, for telcos. Yeah, not like it used to be. Um, you see apprenticeships these days. You see in the uh, in the trades, you know, plumbers, electricians, and things like that. Now I know a number of the telcos do do scholarships. Yeah, right for for uh, students that want to focus on, you know, security as an example or. Um, developing software development, those sort of things, with the, the the principle that they'll finish the university degree and they'll go and work for that telco. But is it an enjoyable environment to be in? Um, I think so. I think so. Um, you know, it it is. I mean, depending on the role, it, you know, at times it can be stressful. You know, if you're in the sales side and you're not making a budget, it's going you're going to have a lot of pressure on you. Um, if you're an account manager uh, and you're not you're not making your numbers, your KPIs, then you're going to have some pressure on you, of course. Um, but in the more technical roles, those sort of things, they're more, you know, as long as you're doing your job, you're going to be fine. And because it's technical, it's it's a logical process. Yeah. Uh, you don't need um, uh, much imagination to do that sort of that side of the role because it's very pragmatic um, and and a logical process. Uh, whereas in sales and account management, you have to have some, have some imagination and some creativity. Um, and it's always the constant pressure, yeah, day to day, correct pressure on you, yeah, correct. So, yes. so if you don't like the pressure, then probably stick with the technical role. Um, but if you're creative and, you, and you're you're a people person, then yeah, sales account management. So, how much social media play a role in your life now? Obviously, you've got kids. You know, everything is on is online, is in through applications. Yeah, yeah. Social media application and so on. Do you track your kids? Do you follow up on what they're doing? Look in the in the early days, in uh, um, I did monitor the kids a bit uh, for what they were looking at and stuff like that. Um, but I mean, in the early days as well, there there wasn't as many scams as there is now. Um, and risks as they are now. They're, the risks have continued to grow. Um, but in the early days, I still monitored them. But, you know, b- by the time they were about 15, um, I, I took the attitude that, you know, they've, they're old enough, they've learnt enough to know what's right, what's wrong, and what they should and shouldn't be doing. Um, so, you know, treat them like a young adult at that time and let them make their own decisions. And, of course, they still have to own the consequences as well. So, yeah. Do you follow the trends? Do you look at the trends? To some now? degree, look, you know. It, it, or you can manage without this side of Yeah, life. look, yes, you know, I have, I have a Facebook profile. You know, my, all Everyone in my generation has one. Um, you know, if I mention Facebook to my daughters, it's like, no, that's that's for you. That's for old people. <laughs> they have no interest in it. They're more Instagram, TikTok, um, uh, you know, what are the whatever the other ones are there's there's a number of them and and most young people in their their teenage years and early twenties are across all those different platforms um and TikTok as well um but me personally no nah. you know i i've um uh, i had a t- i have a twitter profile but i haven't logged on to it for probably five That's years That's really bad yeah um, it's called X, by the way, now. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's, it's easy for him to spell. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's why he's changed it. You know, it's just that's why he signs his name. So back to telco and the work environment yeah. that you've always been in. Obviously, you've been into different um, organizations, different positions, and so on, or titles. What about your own point of view? Can you freely say your own point of view in this environment? Uh, can you talk about politics, philosophy, oh, 
can you have your own thoughts or you have to work within the strict rules? Oh, oh no, look, every, every company has politics. So let, let's park that one for straight away because so now we start talking the right yeah, uh, the every right company, language. Yeah. Every company has politics. Every company tries to shut it down. You just can't. It's it's human nature. There is going to be banter. There's going to be discussions. There's going to be little quiet conversations, you know, at the water cooler and and, and so on. That's just it's going to happen. You're going to get competitive people because I mean, in in the sales and account management environment where you've got KPIs and you're getting measured. There's going to be competition. There's going to be competition in almost every area uh, of a business. You know, that's just, it's human nature yet again. Um, and competition sometimes will, will cause people to get upset if they don't win, you know, and so on. So, um, yeah, I mean, every business is, is going to have that. You know, and once they get to a decent size, it's going to happen whether they like it or not. But can you say your opinions in social politics? Like what's whatever is happening around the world now, can you freely say your opinion or you have just taken into consideration who you are reporting to, who's going to do your, write your paycheck and all this stuff? Look, you can. If you've built a relationship and you're friends with someone you're working with, then, yeah, you can talk about politics and, and, you know, world events and things like that, and that's going to be fine. But if you're, you know, talking to someone for the first time, then that's a no-no. You know, you, you don't do that because you don't know them. You don't know their perceptions. You don't know how they're going to take it. So, you know, there are certain times when certain conversations like politics are off limits yeah. uh, until you get to know someone well enough to understand where they might be. You know, it's... It's it's the old adage, you know, um, you, people will argue because of ignorance, all right? So you've always got to know your audience first before you discuss certain topics, yeah? So you mentioned friends, the word friends in yep. in in this industry. Um, I heard it many times that this industry doesn't have any friendship. You can never build friendship in this industry or um, the day that you leave your job, the second day, they will all try to ignore you. Is this right or is no. this like oh, well, perception? I, I, maybe it's a perception, but I certainly haven't found that. Um, you know, I've I've stayed in touch with, with many, many people um, over the years um, you know, without a problem at all. You know, I, you And, yeah, these are companies I used to work for, and I still stay in touch with people. We catch up for lunch, we catch up for drinks, things like that. So, uh, you know. I, so, really, it's every, I mean, every I'm person. A, is I'm a people unique. person. I'm yeah. a people person, and I take people at face value, and, you know, I treat people the way I'd like people to treat me. Um, and, and that means turning up and, and being there, you know, and, and, and you know, trying to help people, you know. Give out what you ex what you expect to get back, you know those sort of things. So um, that's the way I've brought up, and that's the way I've always been. So um, you know that's why I, I can still go and have a drink with someone I worked with thirty years ago, no problem at all. Uh, and there are many people that, over the years that I've, I've worked with that I can do that with. Fantastic, look, Patrick. Thank you so much for your time today. I think it's been a pleasure. Whatever you've shared is, has been really great. What is your final message to our viewers? Oh. especially the young generation, especially the entrepreneurs, the kids that are, they think that they can do everything overnight. What is your message to them? Oscar Wilde once said, um, be yourself because everyone else is already taken. Um, so that's the first thing I say is be yourself. Um, and then the second thing is, you know, don't be afraid to go after your dreams. Yeah, um, because you know, if you do what you love, then you love what you do. But can you do something that you don't actually love? Um, sometimes you have to. Uh, that's just the nature of the world we live in. You know, if you want to put a roof over your head and food in your mouth, sometimes you have to do stuff that you don't like doing. Um, that's just life, you know, get used to it because it'll, it'll keep happening. That's how it is. 
that's it. It'll keep happening until you, you know, slide into second base at your grave. Um, it's just, <laughs> it's just the way it's going to be. You know, um, you know, life deals deals you bumps and bruises all along the way. Um, uh, the trick is, you know, if you get knocked down, get back up. You know, it's that's what really it's about. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Patrick, thank you so much for being here today. Do you want to share your experience on the podcast today? And what do you think of Brain Spot? Uh, I think you asked too many questions. You're just too curious. <laughs> just... <laughs> oh, look, look, it was great. Um, it was very um, uh, intuitive. Um, it was the conversation uh, flowed very, very well. And we covered a lot of topics. <laughs> Uh, both on a personal level and a career level, which was great. Um, you know, and it was very, how would I say, engaging. It was a very engaging conversation. Um, and you know, it was very comfortable having that conversation uh, and talking about you know, my career and, and my life. Um, you know, it, it flowed very well. Would you recommend Brains Flat to other people? Absolutely. We always have choices and sometimes we pick what seems practical over what our heart really wants. Patrick faced this dilemma, choosing a tech gig over his sports and acting dreams because, well, money matters. Now imagine this. What if he stuck to his passion instead of the paycheck? Where would life have taken him? To be honest with you, I did ask him and his answer was very straightforward. I will do it the same way again. It makes you think, right? Sometimes the path less taken may not be the richest, but it's a different kind of rich. Until next time, stay safe.